God helps those who help themselves. Isn't that's a proverb somewhere, isn't it? That's, I'm sure that's in the Bible. There were times in my life, uh, I remember actually in a Sunday school class, the, the, the teacher said that, and of course I said, well, yes, of course that's a Bible verse because it contains the word God. <laughs> is it true? Now, now, here's the part that's interesting, is the majority of Americans believe it's true. So there was, there was a recent Barna poll, and uh, the, the wording of the poll was, the Bible teaches that God helps those who help themselves. 53% uh, of Americans strongly agree. 22% agree somewhat, so that's 75%. Uh, let's see. Then 7% um, disagree somewhat, 14% disagree strongly, and 5% say they don't, they don't know. <laughs> But it, it's one of those phrases that feels true, doesn't it? God helps those who help themselves and contains the word God. It seems like it's, it's kind of true. And it certainly feels very American. So, of course, it's very true. Now, it is true. It is true, of course, that the, the Bible um, celebrates industry. It celebrates um, taking initiative. It celebrates making plans. It celebrates hard work and determination and effort, these things are true. But what we're going to take a look at today and actually throughout the month of July are some of these sort of phrases that are fairly common in American culture. They sound really true and perhaps even culturally it's kind of believed to be true, but they aren't biblically true. And, and while the, the phrase, God helps those who help themselves, is not entirely untrue, if this is the lens that we are looking at, you know, lens that we are using to understand God and how God works, as we're going to discover today, we're going to be missing most of the picture of who God is. That's why it's so important that we take a look at some of these phrases, these common cultural phrases. I also just thought it'd be kind of fun to do that, this in July where it's a little more laid back. Anyways, we're gonna, over the next four weeks, we're going to be looking at phrases like, of course, God helps those who help themselves today, or next week, go do what makes you happy. We're going to look at that one next week. Where does true happiness come from? Um, the week after that, you don't need to forgive them, or you can't forgive them, or that's unforgivable. It's another phrase we hear. And then finally, the other, the other kind of doozy of a phrase we've probably heard, God will never give you more than you can handle. <laughs> those are phrases that feel true. You might have seen some of those things on Hallmark cards or, you know, you, got, you see they, they make a good plaque. Um, but that doesn't mean that it's biblically true. And as people of the word, it's important that we know what it says in the word. And... So as we look at this phrase, um, God helps those who help themselves, it comes from a, from a, a worldview that, uh, well, as Christians, we somewhat agree with. It comes from actually the, the framework of what's called theism, um, and, uh, or, or even more specifically, deist, which, uh, by the way, Benjamin Franklin, for, at least for a period in his life, was a deist. There seems to be some evidence that later in his life he returned to his Christian roots, and I sure hope he did, because little, little bunny trail. Wouldn't it be cool in heaven to sit down with some of our founding fathers as a nation and like actually ask them, so how did you feel about those things, how things turned out, or what were you really thinking? Wouldn't that be great? I just, I just think about that sometimes. So I hope very much that the, his, you know, the, the historical evidence that points to Benjamin Franklin returning to his Christian roots later in life, I hope very much that's true because I would love to talk to him about this. But there was at least a period in his life where he was a self-proclaimed deist. Um, but deism or theism, this is what it believes. That God exists but is distant. He looks at all the evidence of the created world around us and all the structure and all the order and all the beauty and they go, this can't just be random chance. Duh, exactly. But it, it, all, it also, well, theism basically assumes that God made all of the structures of the world, the physical structures, the physical laws, the moral laws as well, 
But then, for the most part, it just kind of leaves us to figure it out. So if you're a theist, you maybe want to learn the system so you can work the system, but you don't necessarily worship and follow a Savior. God is real. God is powerful. God set everything in motion, but in terms of my day-to-day life, God is distant. And I dare say to you, and I'm wondering about this, I, I think, though there's strong evidence, of course, that Our founding fathers, many of them were Christian. There's all these Christian ideals that are in the foundation of our nation. I think if you look at the average American today, they would say, I believe in God. But their actual approach to life is more theistic. It's the idea that God is real, God exists, but I don't really think about my relationship with God in any significant way. He's out there. Maybe I'll deal with him sometime. Or I'll call him if I need him. He's there, but he's distant. That's why even many churchgoers don't really have much of a prayer life. I mean, what's the point? God's just distant. Or even why many of the conversations in culture, we, we hear about God, is more, it's, it kind of feels like you're looking at the Bible for loopholes. If I can just find that right thing, then I can get the Bible to say what I really wanted it to say. Because we're, it's not a relationship, it's a structure. I've got to learn the system. I've got to learn the system so I can work the system, so I can advance in the system, so I can beat the system. Because it really is all about me rather than my relationship with God. In fact, most religions on earth with really the, well, all religions that are theistic at least, that believe in God, they they have fundamentally that idea. God or the gods or whoever, they put these ideas in, in, in place. They put these systems in place. But it's basically up to us to earn our way to heaven, make our own way to nirvana, to follow the the path, to obey the pillars. It's essentially up to us. Now, of course, Judaism, you know, the, the, the Old Testament, it certainly affirms a personal God, but there's oftentimes it doesn't have that full emphasis. We see it in the prophets, this idea of God knowing us intimately and personally, but that's why Jesus is so absolutely key to understanding the scripture. Jesus is God incarnate. Jesus is God in the, to the fullest degree that we can see and understand and comprehend him. And so it's important that we see what Jesus said about this. And today we're going to look at this uh, this concept, and in fact, this one word, this one big word that you've, you've probably said so many times that you just sort of take it for granted, but it, it is actually one of these really huge, distinctive, and beautiful, powerful ideas in Scripture, which is why I wanted us to spend some time with it today. So, from the backdrop of a world, both the world now and to a certain degree the world back then, You know, back then, even in Jesus' time, a world that would basically fundamentally say, God helps those who help themselves. In fact, if you look at the earliest roots of that phrase. Now, now we know this phrase because of Benjamin Franklin, uh, because he wrote this in um, Richard's Almanac in uh, 1757. It actually goes way, way, way back to the Greek prophet Ovid, who was in the time of of Augustine, so right around the time of, of Jesus, that wrote this phrase, divinity helps those who dare, or the gods help those who help themselves. So even in Jesus' time, this phrase was out there. This idea was out there. Um, Against this backdrop of God helps those who help themselves. He's out there, there's a structure, there are rules. If you follow them, it'll go well for you. And there's a certain degree of truth to that. Jesus says this and it's it's revolutionary so it's so amazing 
So we're going to take a look at Matthew chapter 7. If you've got your Bibles, I encourage you to open them up. Your little, like a U version, glow in the dark. They're in your phones. You know, you can do that. Matthew 7, verses 7 through 11. Ask. Say that with me. Ask. And it will be given to you. Next underlined word is seek. And you will find. Knock. And the door will be opened to you. For everyone who, what's the word? Asks, receives. The one who, what's the word? Seeks, finds. And the one who knocks, the door will be opened. Which of you, if your son asks for bread, would give him a stone? Or if he asks for a fish, would give him a snake. Anybody here would do that? Well, in Jesus' audience, that was, that was true as well. Even a bad parent knows that's a bad idea. Verse 11. If you then, Jesus says, though you are evil, you still know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your, and then there's this key word, what's the word? Father in heaven, give good gifts to those who ask him. If you, though you are evil, tap your neighbor on the shoulder and say, yep, you're pretty evil. If you're married, you know they're evil. <laughs> you, know, you know, you've seen all the stuff, right? You know, they've got good qualities too. But, if you, even though you're evil, you still know how to give good gifts to your kids. Your, your son comes asking for a sandwich. You're, you're not going to give him a rock. How much more will your Father in heaven give good gifts to those who ask? God is our Father. It strikes me that he says, everyone, everyone who asks, receives. Everyone who asks, receives. You know that the prayers, every prayer is answered in some way? Now, sometimes... That, that, that prayer is answered, no. Sometimes it's answered, yes. Or, or I hope you, do you keep a prayer journal? I hope you do. Like, I've just kind of gotten into doing that over the last couple of years. Just, just to jot thoughts down, you know, I'm, today, Lord, I'm asking for. It is remarkable how often something that I've asked God for for several days, but a few days later, I look back on, on how the day's events have gone and go, Wow. <laughs> That sure worked out. <laughs> Sometimes it's good to do that, not, not because God won't answer your prayers if you don't write them down, but it's just good for your own heart to go, oh yeah, I asked and I really did receive. Now sometimes, of course, God will say no, and sometimes God will say, not yet. You're not ready for that yet. Sometimes the deeper work that he wants to do is not just around you, but inside you. Like there's some character stuff he's got to do in you. I want to give that to you, son. I want to give that to you, my beloved daughter. You're just not ready for it yet. I remember when our daughter, our, our oldest daughter, when she was in kindergarten, uh, I think it was around then, and honey, you, you can tell me if I'm, if I'm right or wrong on this. Um, it, so for Christmas, she asked us for a reindeer. Because she had done the internet research, and it turns out, reindeer fly. She did independent studies. Now, and, and of course, we lived about a, it was about a quarter mile, maybe a third of a mile away from school. And, and when, when you're in kindergarten, and we would walk her to school, we, so we took her to Washington Elementary. Anybody else took their kids to Washington Elementary? Anyways, it was a great, great school. And so, uh, but, but it was about a quarter mile away. When you're in kindergarten, that's a long walk. And so she figured it out. She did the, she connected the dots. If I had a reindeer, 
I could just fly to school. It would, it would take me way less time. So she asked us for, uh, for a reindeer for, for Christmas. Great idea, honey. She didn't actually get a reindeer for Christmas. I think that's the year we started to get guinea pigs. We got a guinea pig. Um, but the, the point is, like, I mean, there was, there was nothing ill-intentioned about her request. This is what people who, when you're in kindergarten, you should have imagination like that. What a beautiful thing. She just didn't necessarily see the big picture. How often do we approach God like that? I mean, to just come to him with, with what you, what's actually on your heart, hopefully recognizing that you actually don't see the big picture, even though you've done all the research and you know that reindeer fly. And, and yet, you know, even, even us in our parenting, we could know, well, rain, giving her a reindeer, which we didn't have access, we don't have reindeer access, but, but her desire for a pet was a good one. Let's figure out how to meet that good desire. So was that, was that prayer answered yes, or that request answered yes, or no, or not yet? Was it answered? Yeah. And even a flawed parent, like me, can figure that out. How much more can your Father in heaven figure out how to answer your prayers? He's that good. Although we, although we do weird things to God, though, with our, with our prayers. Can you imagine if, if uh, so uh, our, our daughter, she asks for a reindeer, um, and then we get, to, we get to Christmas morning, and there is no reindeer. What if she stomped and stormed out of the room and said, well, there's no reindeer, so I don't believe in you anymore. <laughs> Mom, I par- I am, I'm a parentless child. <laughs> Because of the absence of a reindeer. But we kind of do that to God sometimes, don't we? Well, God, you didn't give me what I want, so I'm going to punish you by not believing in you. Well, and, and maybe that makes emotional sense in the moment. But when we back up a little bit, it's kind of weird, isn't it? You know, you think of, of how, how a child relates to their, their parents. And in those early years, if, if it's a healthy home and there's been good attachment, there's a whole lot about the relationship with the parent that gets taken for granted. And that's a good thing. That's a good thing. You know, if the child has been raised in a home where they just assume that there's going to be meals, they just assume that it's going to be safe, they just assume that their, their parents are going to be there, then, then their focus is most often on, you know, maybe the, the bonus. You know, they're, they're, not really, they're not really thinking and even consciously thankful for lunch, but can I have a cookie? I mean, the treat sounds amazing. Or the piece of candy. Or, or the gift. Sometimes we take God for granted like that too. You know, we, we want the bonus. We want the extra thing. Not taking into account really what we already have. Now, on some level, that, that, that's, that, that's emotionally, that's kind of good. I mean, if, if you believe and trust in God enough that you can take his gifts for granted, that's actually, that's actually a good thing. But as we grow older, right, and you think about the relationship with your parents as you're growing older. Like, you know, we're, we're in a season in life now where uh, I, haven't, I, mean, I haven't gone through this yet, but I'm assuming that in the next decade it's going to happen where uh, one or, or both of my parents will pass on. Um, 
And I mean, as I've sat next to people as they've lost a parent, I've never heard them say, I just wish they gave me more. But what I've heard time and time and time again is to say, is somebody to say something like, I would give almost anything for just one more day. Have you felt that? Heard that? That reminds us that as our relationship with God matures, we, we realize that our Father, our good Father, He doesn't just answer prayer, though we're grateful that He does. That He actually is the answer. That the, the greatest gift that God offers us, and He offers it freely to all who ask, to all who seek, to all who knock. He offers us relationship with him. So maybe even as you think about God, you know, and you think about God as your father, and you think about what it means to seek him, to ask him, to, to knock, maybe you'd use some of those, 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 those childhood metaphors. They can be beautiful. The idea of you, you know, like the, like the four-year-old who, who sits on their parents' lap and and the, the, the mom, the dad, they read the bedtime story. You know, you know, if you fall asleep reading the Bible, that can be a good thing. <laughs> That's kind of like you're getting in your father's lap and he's reading you a bedtime story. <laughs> and it's okay if you drift off. So it's good to have some of those metaphors as you think about God, those, those really intimate, young child, parent, Metaphors. Might also be good to use some of the other ones, the other parent child metaphor. You know, as you're praying, if, if the idea of sitting on God's lap and having Him read you a book or just put His arms around you, if that feels a little distant, maybe even think about what it'd be like, like you're sitting on, a, on a, a swing on the porch, just side by side. got a cup of coffee in your hand and you're just talking about the day. Your father offers time with you. That's ultimately, I mean, why Jesus died for us on the cross. It's so that all of those things, all of those barriers that keep us from an intimate relationship with God could be dealt with once and for all. So that all who ask can receive. So that all who seek can find. For all those who knock the door can be opened. Our culture tells us that God helps those who help themselves. Jesus tells us God helps those who ask. Or if you really want to get down to it, because it's... You know, this is, again, the difference between just theism and Christianity. It's not just that God exists, but who is God? How do we understand God? What is God like? Is he just like some, some father figure, some figure in, or judge figure in the sky? Is he just the man upstairs? Some guy just shaking his finger at you every time you mess up? No. Jesus says, when you pray, pray, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Our Father. It's one of the most radical phrases that Jesus introduced. We see it more clearly in Jesus than in any, in any Old Testament scripture. 
Though there are definitely scriptures that point in that direction. Jesus just clarified them. And it's a view of God that is distinct. It is Christianly distinct. God wants to know you. Your father, your father, your father. Whether you feel close to him right now, whether you have run away from him your whole life, whether you've turned your back on him, whether your eyes are closed to him, whether you are aware of the presence of your father or not, your father, your father helps those who ask. So today, friends, ask, ask. I want to lead us in a little prayer exercise. I'm actually going to go back to the piano because we're going to move into a, into a song in a minute. But here, here's what I'm going to, ask, going to ask you to do. Is uh, just to take a moment. And we'll let things be a little quiet. But just to connect with God. Like So maybe that's to use that, that mental picture of what it's like to, when, you were, when you were four and you went to your grandma's house and, and you sat down in her lap and she picked up the book and you're reading and you feel safe and warm. Maybe that's the metaphor. Or, or maybe that it's the metaphor of, of uh, you know, time with, your, uh, with a parent and they're, maybe, they're, they're aged a little bit but they're with us and you're sitting on a swing on the front porch and you're just having a heart-to-heart -heart conversation or maybe it's maybe it's something else but to but to just connect for a few minutes with God and that, what, what I would like to invite you to do is to ask him like what's really on your heart take a minute to ask take a minute to seek and then after a few moments I'm going to invite you to do something it might be a little bit Unusual, but it is very scriptural. I want you to So if you're if you're watching online, maybe it's the ar the armchair of the couch, because you're sitting at home. Because you're on vacation and your name's Pastor Paul. <laughs> Enjoy your couch, buddy, it's good. Or you know, maybe if you're here in the room. Find the, the back of a chair in front of you. And after you spent a bit of time with God. Oh, there you go. That's nice. <laughs> or a rim shot. If, you're, if you, you happen to be sitting in the drum booth, you know. Um, but, but to knock. Like to just take a few minutes and just actually ask your father. What's on your heart? You don't need to have it all figured out. It's okay to ask for a reindeer. It really is. He knows what you really need. And he will answer. He will answer. So. just invite you maybe just bow your heads you can close your eyes you can have them open whatever makes sense for you and just ask him what's on your heart what's really on your heart Who's on your heart? Who's really on your heart? What's that need that's been keeping you up at night? Talk to him about it. Father, thank you that we can come to you Thank you that you don't turn us away. Father, thank you that you answer each prayer. 
Lord, thank you that those who seek you find you. Lord, thank you that we can knock. And Lord, you'll open the door. Oh, Father, this morning we knock. We ask. We seek. And after you spent a few moments just asking, seeking, sitting, whether you've, whether you've been, you, whether you have a lot to say this morning to him or not, maybe just as a way of kind of training your heart, <laughs> invite you as you as you ask to.
God, how I need 